Well, good morning. My name is uh, Canadian astronaut Dave Williams, and thrilled to be here. And my name is Shragan Maheshwari, and I'm super excited to be here today, as in a few minutes, we actually get to see a live astronaut from space and talk to him, while also talking to a live astronaut from Earth. So, <laughs> it's kind of neat being here on the ground, but we wanted to talk to you about Canada's role in space. Canada is a major spacefaring nation. We've been involved in the International Space Station program for more than 20 years. In fact, we developed the Canada Arm, this unique robotic arm we used to build a space station on my second spacewalk. I spent six and a half hours riding on the end of the Canada Arm. It was an absolutely incredible experience. But now it's time to get ready for the next phase of human space exploration, sending humans back to the moon. And we're really, really excited that Canada is going to be part of these Lunar Gateway missions, helping build a robotics platform for the Lunar Gateway Space Station, but also developing advanced medical care capability to give us more autonomy to take care of crew members when they're in space. All of this is to help us get ready to send humans to Mars. So Shagun, I wanted to ask you a little bit, how did you get involved in AI? Right, so over the past year, I've been super passionate about artificial intelligence. So I'm 16 years old, and this actually stemmed from when I saw one of the godfathers of AI, Jeffrey Hinton, speaking at a conference. And he was talking about capsule neural networks. So I got super interested in this technology, and I actually did a deep dive. So I understood the intuition and math behind AI, as well as increasing my programming capabilities to start building different AI models. As people say, the best way to learn something is to actually create it. And what I find super interesting is the intersection between AI and healthcare. So what I've also been doing is building machine learning models to be able to identify cancerous genes within a data set of 5,000 cancerous genes. So that's pretty remarkable. And <laughs> I have to ask, how old were you when you started this? I was 15. 15 years old, that's absolutely incredible. So why do you think AI is important? How is this gonna transform the future of healthcare? Yeah, so the reason why AI is so important is because it makes our lives more personalized and more efficient. If you think about it, AI is basically a superpower that gives us the ability to analyze immense amount of data that our human mind isn't able to analyze in one instance. So I'll give you an example. There was a project where researchers built this machine learning algorithm to help identify and classify breast cancer in the slide images of a patient's tissues. What happened was that the AI algorithm actually had an 89% accuracy, whereas just a trained medical doctor whose job is to classify breast cancer only had a 73% accuracy. So that's just one way how AI can aid us to de delivering more better patient care and just making our entire process of our work, our jobs, and our life more efficient and more seamless. So as you know, I'm a doctor. Do I have to worry that I'm gonna be replaced in the future by AI? I actually don't think so. Um, I actually see AI as a tool that can help medical doctors because I strongly believe that we still need that human interaction. But what AI does, it helps us give better patient care and a better diagnosis for humans. And station, it's Dave Williams here at C2 in Montreal. How do you hear me? Dave, nice to hear you, and I hear you loud and clear. Good to see you. <laughs> Excellent. It's so good to see you again. And again, congratulations on the fantastic spacewalk you did. I'm here in Montreal with Shagun, an absolutely amazing individual, and I want to tell you a little bit more about her in a sec. Certainly, looking forward so to hearing. So Shagun is 16 years old. She's been in. Yeah. She's 16 years old, and she's been involved in developing AI protocols already for health. And these are the kinds of things that uh, we're very excited about, and look forward to taking back to the moon and enabling us to go farther to Mars. But she has some questions for you that she wanted to ask. Yeah. Hi, Dave. So I've actually never talked to an astronaut who's in space, so this is an amazing experience for me. And what I wanted to ask you is, since you reached the International Space Station, what has been the most significant change mentally and physically for you? 
<laughs> so it was a, uh, it was actually an uh, interesting process to watch as a physician. You know, first, uh, physically, there's a lot of changes to your body. You completely lose your sense of balance, of course. And then you, you so initially, that's very uh, disorienting and also provocative. You kind of feel nauseous a little bit for a while. And then your body fluids are shifted all the time. You get a feeling of being congested as if you had a cold all the time. Maybe you can hear it in my voice. It's still there a little bit. Um, so physically, quite a lot of things happening. But the most fun thing, of course, is you have to learn to fly because uh, you know you can't walk here and you kind of use your hands but uh, the most efficient way is to gently push yourself the way you want to go and fly but that needs some training so and then psychologically i was worried maybe i would feel you know be lonely or kind of enclosed in here but not at all i mean you're in constant contact with people you love on earth and constant contact with mission control and constant uh, contact visually with the world uh, out the window so it is actually uh, not a claustrophobic or lonely experience uh, at all, as, as you might fear. Wow, that's amazing insight. And <laughs> wow. So, have you learned any cool tricks while, like, like cartwheels, somersaults, while you're aboard the International Space Station? Or can you show them to us? Well, I mean, it's very sure. I can I can flip around. I thought so. I'm gonna try not to bump my head anywhere. The trick, if you want to flip, is to not impart too much uh, lateral movement, so you don't end up bumping the walls. The biggest challenge we have is station is shaped like a T, and so along the long stem of the T is, uh, you know, probably. 40 meters. If you can fly a straight line down there without touching anything, then uh, then you've earned your title. <laughs> awesome. And I also know that you've been deploying a lot of science experiments in space that have been given to you by academia and research institutions. So can you tell us more about that? So a lot of the research we do here uh, is is uh, about human health, uh, in particular uh, everything that uh, Canada sponsors is to do with medicine or uh, basically biological sciences. But in general, the station is a, an immense laboratory. Thousands of experiments have been done since the beginning. There's hundreds going on at this moment. I'll do several hundreds myself. Um, and so the what's interesting here is that kind of there's two categories, you know, there's for the purpose of learning how to live in space and learning how to go to the moon and Mars eventually. And also all, everything we do for that, if you want self-serving purpose of uh, astronautics, has direct applications back on Earth, and which this is why it's so interesting to do medical research here, because everything that happens to astronauts on orbit uh, is something that resembles a real disease on Earth. But it happens here on otherwise healthy individuals, happens very quickly, so we're like the perfect guinea pigs for medical research up here. That's awesome. So can you give an example of an innovative technology that you're currently testing in space that has implications of benefit here on Earth? Yeah, a few examples come to mind. So in the terms of uh, experiments on biology, for example, it's been noticed that the astronauts, they kind of develop in many ways a, a, a accelerated aging while we're in space. And one of the things that ages is your uh, your uh, blood vessels. And so there's a key experiment called vascular echo that looks at the accelerated stiffening of arteries in astronauts as it resembles things that happen to elderly people on Earth. Uh, and so that's one example where uh, trying to figure out a medical problem for astronauts is going to have direct application to people on Earth. And then in terms of technology, so it's difficult here to, um, you know, it's uh, cumbersome to monitor our vital signs for the doctors on the ground. They have to plug electrodes and maybe have tubes. Just, we don't want to do that. So the, we are developing a uh, basically a smart shirt that would do that for you. You just have to wear this garment and it measures all your vital signs. So that could be used very effectively on the ground as well in remote communities or maybe people who work in dangerous environments or in the mines, for example, or our military when they're deployed. So, you know, space is just and one example of an extreme distant environment. So any solution we apply to this place can be applied to any other difficult environment on the planet.
David, some of the changes that are taking place in your body are quite remarkable. You know, being in space as long as you've been there, you're losing muscle strength, you're losing bone density. What are some of the things that you're doing to prevent those losses and to get ready to come back and see us here on Earth in about a month or so? Yeah, the main challenge for me, I want to be able to go back to Earth, walk, and carry my children on my shoulders. So that's a, I, I set the bar high. And so the way to do that, you have to exercise. The thing is, your body is very conservative with its energy. If you don't use your muscles or your bones, then your body doesn't really feel like it has to maintain them. And there's a biological cost to maintaining strong muscles and strong bones and strong tendons. So like on Earth, if you're a couch potato and you don't do any exercise, well, you will not be in shape. Same here. We're a bit like in constant bed rest, you know. For most of the days, we, it's so easy for our bodies that uh, if we're not careful, we're just going to dither away. So we have to exercise. We have to stress our bodies, strain them. So we do two hours of heavy exercise a day, half cardio and half kind of weight resistance. So uh, that way, we actually, actually man manage to maintain quite a lot of uh, good bone strength and good uh, muscle strength. And uh, the only thing I'll have to do when I come back is learn to walk again because I will have lost my sense of balance. Well, we're looking forward to seeing you back on the planet. I'm wondering, though, with all the research that you're doing, these incredible Canadian experiments that we have on board the space station, how is that going to help us back here on Earth? How will it help us get ready to send humans back to the moon? And will we learn anything on the space station that will ultimately help us send humans to Mars? Yeah, so to go, this is a big dream, right? Uh, to go back to the moon and eventually go to Mars. And uh, to the young people in the audience, I want to highlight that uh, the people who will go to Mars, uh, it's not me, I'm probably too old, but they're born and they're young people right now. So it could be anybody, uh, anybody there, anybody in the room, anybody who's listening who has this crazy dream. And we will need a lot of science and a lot of technology to solve the problems that we need to solve to be able to go there. And healthcare is one of the big problems we have to figure out because you know, right now here on Space Station, we can always entertain the idea that we can come back to Earth if there's a big problem. But on the way to Mars or on Mars, no way. The crew has to be more autonomous and the distance and in and of itself pauses new challenges that forces us to scratch our heads to find new solutions. And that's where the benefit is for everybody because the challenge of space has this power to you know, kind of make us sit down and think harder. So we need to figure out better, for example, miniaturized medical devices uh, that would be robust and therefore we could use them in you know, remote areas on Earth as well. Uh, we be, could use point of care at the bedside instead of a, you know, at a fancy lab. We can use smarter sensor technology so that it's less cumbersome to just get your vital signs or do exams uh, or get more information about your body or your blood. Uh, also, we could have like computers become our medical assistants basically use artificial intelligence uh, in that way to uh, to help astronauts on a long duration mission far away make good medical decisions and you can imagine back on earth of course that would have direct applications to the millions of cases every day where people are scratching their head if they had a little robot helping them making decisions that might be useful so all these things i think uh, are direct meshing with uh, the needs of, uh, of, the, of humans on Earth. So I think, in a way, space exploration is like a great excuse to summon the best of our uh, smarts and strengths to figure out these tough questions, and then we always unavoidably end up benefiting from them. So tell me, Shogun, do you think that uh, AI could be applied to uh, healthcare in space? Definitely. Um, there's actually research being done um, for using AI to better detect osteoporosis with an astronaut in space. And I, could, I definitely think that that technology can also be applied to humans on Earth. Because osteoporosis is a disease where human bone mass deteriorates. And that's a huge problem for astronauts in space because they're in the environment of microgravity. But this AI algorithm is actually able to identify and classify osteoporosis within an astronaut better than current methods, as current methods actually osteoporosis in astronauts is detected in a later stage uh, when an astronaut has that disease. And that can also be applied to humans on Earth because we see osteoporosis, especially with humans who are aging. So I definitely think that AI can be applied to healthcare in space while also improving healthcare on Earth.
Pretty good. Yeah, we can also think of all the people who are better than in hospitals. Talking about how AI is going to help us in hospitals, and then we're going to transition over to some questions from folks here on the ground. Yes, I was just mentioning that uh, another segment of the population that uh, in a way resembles astronauts in terms of physical inactivity is the people who are better than in hospital. So all these people would benefit from better understanding of how do you prevent your body from decaying when you're not using it much, which is the problem that we face. Excellent. So I think Shagun is going to take us through some uh, questions that we have from the students on the ground here, and we'll run through those. And David, uh, looking forward to hearing your answers. Right. Um, I think that the people in the audience are actually asking questions to David yeah. right now. So where's our first question? Yeah, I think we, we have a <laughs> special microgravity microphone that we can throw around. My name is Shannon. Uh, hi, David. Uh, my question is, knowing what you know now from living on a terrestrial planet and living in outer space, what advice would you give your younger self? Well, uh, I've been lucky to get advice myself as a young uh, person, and I think uh, that advice uh, served me well. And I would give the same advice, which is uh, to listen to that little voice follow your dreams you know sometimes we're afraid of our dreams because they're crazy they seem too big uh, and we should never never be afraid of our dreams because uh, what can be scary about a dream is that you think well what if i don't achieve it then i'll be very disappointed but that's not a good excuse not to go in that direction because it's the journey that makes you so and every decision that you make and going in that direction will turn you into whoever you will turn out to be. So the advice would be listen to your heart, basically. Listen to the little voice because uh, it is a treasure. It is your best treasure, most valuable thing is that dream that tells you which way to go in the morning when you wake up. Hello, David. It's an honor to talk to you again. Ceux qui me suivent sur YouTube ont eu la chance d'entendre ta sagesse spatiale déjà. C2 is about combining commerce and creativity. How do you express creativity during your stay aboard the space station? Yeah, so creativity is a very broad word, you know. You can be creative in a kind of a technical way, in a scientific way, in a human way, in an artistic way, of course, which is the way we think about it most of the time. Uh, and so creativity just means thinking laterally means just not, you know, not looking straight forward all the time, but looking sideways and making uh, decisions that, they encom that encompass, that take into account the entire situation. So I think that's how we can uh, express our creativity here in a technical environment, is to make sure that we have broad perspective the whole time and take everything into account. And that way you can kind of make sure you're doing the right thing, which is what creativity is all about. And in a more artistic sense, for me here, the best, the most fun way to be creative is to is by taking photos of the planets, getting the right angle, making sure I have the the right lighting, and making sure I'm kind of conveying the impression that the, the view gives me. We we love these photos online. Uh, another question: the space sector is one of the few industries where countries and businesses around the world seem to work in close collaboration, unlikely allies sometimes. What is it like to be part of this and to work so closely with astronauts from across the planet? You know, uh, it's actually one of my, my prides uh, as a member of the astronaut corps. I think we all feel that pride that we, the nature of our job is international. And because of that, every day we demonstrate that when humans decide to work together, they can work together. And just that is a very important thing to keep in mind because, you know, you listen to the news and you might think we're doomed to just never getting along. That is not true. 
we're not doomed. We can work together. And when we do, we achieve incredible things. And it's not because people in the space sector are incredible people. It's because they incredibly work well together. And that's how we accomplish uh, these incredible tasks. So it gives me a lot of hope for the future, hope for my children to see that over decades, the space program has existed as an international collaboration. It has gone, you know, tr crossed wars and the Cold War and it has gone over tensions and still it's as if we're on this little bridge. You know, there's a bridge between nations that's in space and that's the space program in my mind. Hi, my friend. Uh, I just want to know how one become a polymath like you. You know, it's just happened step by step uh, out of curiosity. I think uh, I was just never ashamed of asking questions and being curious. And uh, I'm one of those persons who it, it bugs me when I don't understand something. I just can't say, oh, whatever. No, it just bugs me to not understand something. And maybe there's people like that in the room. Uh, and so it's like my hobby in life. Not even my hobby. You know what? I would actually say that is my dream in life. The dream I've had as a young child, it was a crazy dream. It's the crazy dream of understanding everything. Of course, it's impossible, right? Uh, but I'm going to try. I'm going to try hard. Amazing insight. Uh, quick question before I pass the mic to Julie. Which expedition did you prefer the most? Your space mission or caves here on Earth? Ha! Caves was amazing. I don't know if you've seen the videos that we made there down there, but what a strange place just below the surface of the Earth. Speleology is just unbelievably beautiful. But you know what? The view up here definitely beats the view in caves. Uh, the view of the planet. Whenever I go to the cupola in the morning and I open the shutters and I look at planet Earth, I'm just awestruck every day. It never gets old. It's just how beautiful Mother Earth is. You know, it, it's alive. You can tell it's alive. And it's not just blue. It glows blue and the deadly darkness of space. And it's clearly the only thing alive out there. Uh, and it is the spaceship keeping billions of human spe uh, humans and other species alive in a deadly vacuum of space. It is just glorious and it's a miracle. It's like an oasis in the middle of space. Bonjour, Monsieur Saint-Jacques. Julie, en direct de la Terre. J'ai toujours rêvé de dire ça. Do emotions, David, play an important role in decision-making during a mission? Yep, definitely. Uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, you want to make decisions that uh, will result in people feeling confident uh, about what's going on. So, you know, that you've got to take care of people's emotions. Uh, your crewmates, the mission controllers, the owner, their scientists, in the sense that you, you know, we're all trying to do a good job and instill, you know, confidence in what we're doing. And so in that sense, uh, emotions take a stand. But when it, takes, when it comes down to a technical decision, uh, I try to kind of, in my mind, separate it. And, uh, you know, to re remember that the hardware on station only listens to physics and chemistry, basically. It doesn't listen to my emotions. Uh, and so kicking it in anger is not going to help. Um, but otherwise, but that is only a small fraction of the challenge of a space mission, of course. It's just an expedition, and an expedition is a human adventure. And we're here, six people right now on board, all the, the and huge team, the flight controllers and mission control. That is the space mission. It's all those human brains working together uh, at a distance sometimes. So, and uh, taking care of human relationships is fundamental to making any expedition a success. So, David, thank you so much for answering the questions, for joining us today. We've been so excited with the remarkable mission that you've been uh, conducting in space. We're so proud of the Canadian science that we see in space and the robotic arm that's been used to grapple uh, docking spacecraft. It's just been fantastic. Really, really appreciate it, and we look forward to seeing you back on the ground.
Thank you, Dave. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, C2. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, C2. <laughs> Follow your dreams. The future is in your heads. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes well, our really event. Well, we're really excited. Thank you, Canadian Space Agency and participants. Station, we are now resuming <laughs> operational audio communications. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. And thanks very much to the team in Mission Control in Houston for an absolutely outstanding event. <laughs> So it's been great being here in Montreal. Thanks so much for coming to see us and hear about what we're doing in space and follow the Canadian space program because there's no question that incorporating AI into technology to drive the future of healthcare and create autonomy in space will change the way in which we explore space. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Oh.